Okay, well, <clears throat> the danger in going second is that the previous speaker might have already said everything we're going to say, uh, instead of better, uh, or that uh, they covered some things that left you with nothing to say. And I think that uh, I'm fine because John has covered things at a level of detail that I'm not going to go into. And I, I think a lot of the information that he provided is the kind of sort of nitty gritty on the ground sort of issues that you deal with that design guidelines are supposedly um, developed to address. And it was good to see all the examples of, of situations in real life. Quickly before I launch into the PowerPoint show, these are the existing design guidelines that the city is working with right now in the design review program. And as John mentioned earlier, that is um, strictly for uh, commercial multifamily developments of, of, cer of certain sizes. So it's not, for example, your single family neighborhoods and things. Um, in fact, John and his firm makers were the original, uh, well, writers, authors of, of these guidelines for the city back in 1993 when the design review program was initiated. And they have served the city very well uh, in all that time. It was only in the last couple of years that uh, we were, the city as a whole, the city council members and a couple others were looking at the design review program and, and largely uh, reviewing it and finding that it has been pretty successful. I mean, always room for improvement, but for the most part, it has accomplished the objectives of bringing the dialogue out into the community, and I mean literally in the community, as you know, I hope some of you have had a chance to experience design review board meetings. Um, they're usually held in the community in which the project's being proposed, uh, and citizens get a chance to sit in and listen to the deliberations, and there's always a segment of the meeting where members of the public are allowed to comment as well. So that was one of the chief goals of the design review program, is to bring that design dialogue, the, the conversation about the quality of architecture and projects in our city, into basically our community, uh, and have it be something that we could all participate in, because we all live here, we all have opinions about it. Uh, the other objective, um, well, another objective of the design review program has been always to try to continually foster a higher and higher quality of design. Um, we've had critics who've said well, it hasn't done that, and I think there are certain plenty, plenty of examples of buildings where maybe we didn't reach the highest we could have. But overall, um, most people, both from the development side and from the community side, have said, well, with its pros and cons, the program is serving us pretty well. So um, recently, as I said, the last couple of years, one of the things that we were looking at is Gee, it's been, you know, the program started in 1994. I think you did the guidelines just the year before in 93 to, to gear up for the program. Um, it's been about 17 years or so. What have we learned? Is there anything new that we need to talk about or address? And so I was um, asked to, to work on the project. We hired a consultant, uh, Weinstein Architects and Urban Planners. I worked with a woman named Leslie Bain with that firm. And we basically analyzed the existing design guidelines and found, essentially, for the most part, that they had stood the test of time and were working fine. So uh, on one level, there was nothing broken, so there was nothing to fix. We did have some feedback from, from design review board members and users of the guidelines that over time, the program had gotten a little more complicated by the fact that uh, neighborhoods through the neighborhood planning process really got excited about the design review program and many of them said, you know, the citywide guidelines are great. These apply basically throughout the city except downtown. They're great, but we'd love to say a few more things that are specific to our neighborhood. And so that uh, spawned a whole generation of what we call neighborhood specific design guidelines. And there are some for the Pike Pine area, for Capitol Hill, for Ballard. Um, to date, we have 19 different sets of neighborhood design guidelines. So over time, as the design review boards in each of the districts of the city began working with these, you can imagine in the course of an evening, they're shuffling through neighborhood books over here and the citywide ones here. There's a lot of material to digest. And one of the objectives um, that the department had, the city had, in asking me and Leslie to look at um, updating the original design guidelines was just to maybe shift the format and organization a little bit so uh, it would be easier to, to deal
deal with in, in basically in meeting settings and, and otherwise. So I will go through a little bit and show you what's the same and what's different um, about the proposed new guidelines, and I'll talk a little bit about the process as well. Um, I will note, I have 15 copies here, I'm going to go ahead and let those go around. I don't know if that's enough for everybody. Um, oh, wait a second, I think one of the bottom is mine. Let me put my notes. Oh, no, they're there. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to give all my secrets away. So anyway, um, these are still draft. I've noted that on the front cover. We are expecting to transmit the whole legislative package to city council sometime in the next maybe two to three weeks. So, um, all right. And when will the final decision be then? Uh, it depends on what the council's calendar is, when we get on their calendar. Mm -hmm. But I, and I honestly can't speculate on that. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing somewhere, you know, early summer, mid summer, mm -hmm. perhaps. Okay, so um, I said I was going to take you back up to the 10,000 foot level, and I'm really doing that. I'm starting with what are the sale design guidelines? And I think, as I already mentioned, they're, they're essentially the primary tool that's used in the design program to evaluate new development. Um, originally drafted in 93, amended a little bit in 98, a few more things were added to it, and then still in course today. Uh, the recent update is poised for adoption. The goals to foster design excellence, to allow flexibility in the application of land use uh, code standards. And um, those are some of the, there are requirements in the land use code that can sometimes, at the, at the, uh, at the uh, judicious you know, opinion of the design review boards, can be relaxed or modified in some way if if the project can otherwise show that it is meeting the intent of the, of the land use code, but doing it in a slightly better way through meeting design guidelines. So that's a key component. That's one of the sort of incentives that developers have to, to work with the, with the design review program and the design review boards, is if they have a, what they feel is a more creative, a better idea, they can pitch an idea and say, could we have some, some um, ability to deviate from what the actual standard is as long as we meet it in these other ways. And then that's a decision that the board makes based on public feedback, um, their own expertise and skill, uh, and, and also in coordination with land use staff at the city. And I also mentioned that one of the goals of the program originally was to create this public, public forum for discussing quality design. Um, one of the things, you know, we're looking for fostering design excellence. Well, what is that? You know, some people say, gosh, really architecture and design is so subjective that how can anybody, you know, it's really every, every person's opinion. And I will say that I, I personally agree that there is a lot about it that can be subjective, but there are also a lot of um, tried and true design um, standards that have come down through centuries, really. And that's what the design guidelines try to incorporate, is some of that tried and true, timeless advice that, that makes sense, that all good buildings that are well designed um, usually have. Um, some of the ways you can define design excellence are that maybe a new project is going to fit very seamlessly into its context. It's not something that, that jumps out and is a sort of a jarring intrusion. Uh, another way to look at design excellence is, is it timeless in terms of remaining functional uh, and sort of ageless over many years? Is it something that is a flash in the pan and, and really doesn't hold up both physically or even stylistically? Uh, or is it something that can continue to go into reuse over the, over the decades? Uh, another, increasingly in today's uh, sort of view of design, a good design and design excellence exemplifies wise use of resources and, and good stewardship of the environment. Sustainability is the buzzword of the, of the decade, I suppose. Um, I think that good design has always been sustainable, and in many ways it's just good common sense. You don't design something out of flimsy materials, as John said, uh, that's going to fall apart in two years. That's just a waste of money, and, and, uh, but I guess you could call that sustainability today. It's so, that later on. so Cheryl, the, the, the characteristics that you're just talking about now I never heard the phrase T111 before, but yeah. the remodeled Windermere building in Wedgwood, um, uh, the, the front, it's got some, what 
looks to me like wood paneling on it because we value wood, so mm -hmm. they stuck some wood on there. Mm -hmm. And is that what it is? Is that mm -hmm. is, is it the T one leg or material is not? No, that's not the T one. That's the T one one was on the side. On the side. The side. Okay. So if we would say that it possesses other qualities valued by the community, we'd say sticks of wood on there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if that is a value, yeah, if it's something you value, then that would be a recommendation, and hopefully you'd be able to back that up by saying, look at our setting. You know, we we are we're richly landscaped here. There, there's a the context of other buildings. It's primarily wood. You know, you, you want to make some arguments that would sort of bolster that. Now, that doesn't mean that fitting in, that always fitting in, is the only way to go. You can be a, an excellent design and have some new ideas, something new to say something contemporary and still fit in and still be a, a contribution. So it, it gets, it does get a little, that's where the subjectivity starts to come in. It gets a little trickier. Um, we keep moving forward. A little bit more of a continuation here. What is the purpose of the design guidelines? I think John has done an excellent job of showing you very specific examples of guidelines where their purpose is to help you, help the developer uh, create the best design possible, very specific things like with the parking lot and the sidewalk widths and, and et cetera. Again, up at this 10,000 foot level, um, what we're saying here is it, the purpose is to define the qualities of architecture, urban design, and public space that make for su successful projects and communities. That's a little bit, you know, lofty language, but it really means the same thing. If you don't know what you what is successful, you haven't defined it or identified it, how are you going to ask for it? You have to know what it is that you want to begin with. The second purpose is to provide guidance to developers and designers in how best to meet the city's expectations. And when I say cities, I mean these expectations that are laid out in the current ones and the expectations that are laid out in the, the proposed guidelines that will presumably be adopted pretty soon. Um, those are the city's expectations, having incorporated a lot of feedback from community members. So I guess it's sort of city with a little c and a big c. Uh, and also, the, a third point here is another important purpose of the design guidelines is to set the parameters for constructive discussion of proposed projects. What does that mean? What it means is that if you come, the design review board is most successful when everyone around the table and in the audience understands what they're there to talk about. If you come in talking about something that is not their purview, they don't have any authority to, to render decisions on it, it's, it's kind of a waste of everybody's time. And part of the role of the design guidelines is to set forth those, that box. It's kind of say, here's the things we talk about in these meetings. This is what design review is set up for. Frame your arguments in these terms. Use this language understand these concepts, and that's how you can put forward your opinions. If you come in talking about, and I'll be real specific on this one because this comes up a lot, if somebody comes to a design review board meeting and really is saying, I don't want that development because I don't think we should have commercial structure in this place, that's not what design review is designed to address. The zoning code, if it allows commercial uses there, then that's, that's allowed by right. So that's an example of a topic that wouldn't get much traction at a design review meeting. It's not a vehicle for stopping development that's already permitted as of right by zoning. That's important to know because sometimes, you know, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna try to use design guidelines to get at something that they're not designed to and ultimately that's not gonna work. So it's best to just know it up front. How do the design guidelines work? Um, a little bit repetitive with the above, but by presenting clear performance-based statements about what we value. John used the word prescriptive in his discussion a few times, so I thought I, I wanted to make, take just a moment to talk about pres prescriptive design guidelines versus performance-based ones. There's a, there's a role and a, and a reason to use both at different times. For the most part, in the sort of citywide ones, we aimed more for what we call performance-based, which is to say, for example, um, make the pedestrian feel welcome and, and safe, let's say, on the street, on the sidewalk. That's what you want to achieve, is, is comfort and, and welcoming quality for a pedestrian. 
Why? Because more pedestrians on the street create a livelier community, livelier, livelier neighborhood. People feel safer, they're out, they're going to meet and talk and, and greet. So how do you do that? Well, one way you might do it is by having the street furniture out there. Another way you might do it is by having a nice landscaping. Another way might be the, the shop windows that allow a view into the store and in, encourage people to have to take a stroll because there's something interesting to look at. If the design guideline only said, guideline number one, put a bench on the sidewalk. Okay, you put a bench on the sidewalk. Somebody puts one somewhere that has no relationship to anything and it doesn't solve, it doesn't get us anywhere. If you don't tell people why they're doing it and what they're supposed to be trying to achieve, it, it's, it sort of defeats the purpose. So that's why performance-based is how do you want the space to perform? What are you trying to get at? That way it leaves room for all kinds of solutions that we may not even come up with yet. There might be something that comes out 20 years from now. I mean, actually, one example I can think of is it isn't too long ago that the, um, John, what's the right language for it? With transit, um, transit stations and stops where they have the real time information. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, that was, that was, gosh, when I was a kid, you just had a pole with a, maybe a sign on it, you know. Now, I mean, they got real time. It's flipping through and telling you, bus coming in 10 minutes. That's something we never could have envisioned 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. So we wouldn't have been able to write a design guideline about it. But a, a good guideline that would have left room for it would have said something like provide um, amenities to encourage transit use. Wow, real time, you know, bus information fits the bill. So that's the difference kind of between performance based and prescriptive. Prescriptive tells you exactly what to do and may or may not tell you why or give you options to do something else. There are reasons sometimes when you want to do that, but there are other times when you just want to say, here's how I want it to perform, and I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt that you might come up with some creative ways to do it that I haven't thought of yet. I know we're getting close to time here, so. Okay, in terms of organizing the way that uh, the proposed new updated guidelines are being organized, um, we're boiling them into three categories. Uh, 11 guidelines total that go in a hierarchy from quite general to more specific, broad to narrow. Um, several subcategories for each guideline, guideline and cross-references cross throughout. The one thing that, that I sure found in working on the guidelines with uh, Leslie Bain is that just as soon as we thought we had an organizational structure that was perfect, we found that, oh no, you can do it this way, and this way, and this way. <laughs> There's no perfect way to organize things. All these design principles, frankly, overlap and, and supplement and support each other so much that it's pretty hard to, to create artificial categories. The categories that exist, those are for our benefit, the human mind, in organizing ideas and thoughts. They're not because the ideas are separate in real life, okay? They're done for the benefit of the design review board members, community members, developers, and applicants who are trying to work with these materials and um, put, put the put the discussion out there in a, in a logical way. So the three categories of guidelines are, are um, context and site, public life, and design concept. I'll talk a little bit about each one as we go through here. Okay, context and site. Uh, every site has a context. That just means where do, you, where, where do you live? Where does this where does this site live? Each project contributes to and is part of the greater context that defines the character of the city. Some sites frankly, are more important than others. This is, this is sort of like Animal Farm, but in the, you know, the reverse of <laughs> the, uh, some, some sites are truly more important than others. You may have a site that's at a pivotal corner uh, in the city that happens to be maybe slightly elevated on a hill that everybody can see from easily two or three miles around. That's a really important site. That, whatever happens on that site is going to affect the entire fabric of the city. Other sites, maybe you've got an infill site in the middle of a block on a quieter street. Doesn't mean it's not important, it's just not as visible. Maybe it doesn't rank quite as high in the overall hierarchy of, of sites. So it's important to understand where are you in that context? Are you going to be a big player in the middle of that block? You, I mean the project. Is the project going to be a big player on that block? Is it a little corner add-in? 
Is it um, something that's uh, stellar and has citywide significance, or is it something pretty local and tied to that neighborhood? All understanding that context is is important for the designer uh, and the developer in terms of it's really akin to I call it is listen first and talk later, or listen first and design later. Look around. Find out what the neighborhood is like that you're moving into. And this is where you guys have an important role as community members at the meetings, at least at the meetings, hopefully even before that, you have an opportunity to say, hey developer, if you don't know who Wedgwood is, this is who we are, this is what we're like, this is what we value. That's an important fact-finding sort of thing that they need to go through, we believe they need to go through, and that's why we have this section context and site right up front. Um, I, can't, I call it sort of a little joke, my joke, location, location, location. It's really important uh, because that is what gives the designer clues to how he or she may decide to respond to the site. They've been given a, a job to design a building for a particular place. How's it going to fit in? Is it going to, you know, how's it going to respond to what's there? This is roughly, this, this section is roughly equivalent to parts of the old guideline sections that were called site planning, that John talked about, a section called height, bulk, and scale, and another one called architectural concept. So if you, and you, you probably don't, you don't want to, but if you wanted to, you could take this and the proposed new set, and you could find just about every idea that's in the old one is still here, rearranged a little bit, formatted a little differently, but it's there because these all still work. How is this different from the original guidelines? The context is still the heart of the guidelines approach, and it was in, in the version that, that makers prepared for us originally too. Uh, we, what we have done is we've broadened it a little bit to occasionally include the whole city or an entire neighborhood, and that goes back to the comments I just made a moment ago about sometimes some sites are, are extremely uh, important for whatever various reason it might be. We're also, also allowing for a slightly wider range of what constitutes a good fit. Um, I guess I have to explain a little bit here. We had gotten over the years a little feedback from the design community that the original design guidelines, uh, they felt, were constraining them somewhat in terms of contemporary interpretations. They, they felt in some ways that the original guidelines were suggesting too much of mimicking what's already in place. Or, in some cases, we found that, uh, in the previous slide I, I said, uh, there's always a context. Sometimes the context isn't that great. Maybe you're the first, the project that's coming in is going to be the first one that's going to set the tone in an otherwise mm, kind of marginal area or a place that's been transforming. And in that case, gosh, you sure wouldn't want to match the existing context. If anything, you're trying to create a new context and set a path for others to follow that really raise the, the level of quality. So uh, so that's where we sort of picked in a little bit. It's, it's subtle, but you'll find it as you read the design guidelines, just a, a little bit more room to say, we can accept some new ideas and some contemporary art ex expressions uh, and still find a way to make them fit. The three guidelines that are in this section are natural systems and site features, urban pattern and form, and architectural context and character. Each one of these is, and that is the text for each, each guideline, you will see at a, immediately how general it is. Use natural systems and features of the site and its surroundings as a starting point for project design. It is quite general. There are two things I want to say about that. One is that under each guideline in the proposed set, there are what we call sort of subcategories under the main guideline. And for CS1, Natural Systems and Site Features, for example, we have a little subcategory on energy use. We have another one on sunlight and natural ventilation. We have another one on topography. Uh, and, and, and two more, plants and habitat and water. All of those, those five sort of subcategories all relate to the primary guideline. And they all were expressed, all the ideas were expressed in this one too. Organizing them this way is, is really about user friendliness uh, more than anything else. It's not so much sub substantive change as it is uh, making it easier for the, the design review board members and public and others at a glance to see 
where they might fit in. It's also designed so that with the, with the overall guideline being relatively general, it leaves room for the board or community members to bring up an idea and a, or an issue. And as long as it fits under that general rubric, you're covered. <laughs> you have room, you have license, for example, to talk about it. The more specific you are, there's a chance that, you know, that some that issue is left out. And somebody said, well, you can't talk about retaining walls because the guideline doesn't say anything about a retaining wall. Well, if you leave it more general, then you have more room, more latitude, I guess, to address issues as they arise. So for, I won't go through all of them because we're short of time, but for each one of these three guidelines in this section, uh, there's a little something, uh, there are several categories, subcategories that talk about specific issues. Okay, the second section is my personal favorite, uh, and it's called Public Life. The amount and quality of public life is one measure of the community's livability. And Seattle's success in creating a walkable, active, attractive city is fundamental to a sustainable future. I'm not an architect, so I hope I won't offend any architects in the room. I think sometimes architects and maybe architectural aficionados can get so caught up with beautiful buildings that, in my opinion, they sort of forget what it's all about. It's about people. People are used in the buildings. People are living in them, people are working in them, people are walking past them and around them. Uh, so this section is really all about public life. Do, do the buildings exist just to be viewed as interesting architecture? No, they exist because it's, it's an environment that, that we live in. And, and if it's going to be good for us to live in it, they need to be designed well with that in mind. This is roughly equivalent to the old guidelines section called pedestrian environment. It really is about that. It's about the place where the pedestrian is. How different from the original guidelines? The new ones talk a little bit more about sort of the, the so, social, uh, social aspect uh, of, of design and how it can either help or hinder interaction between people. Uh, it talks a little bit more, too, about maybe economic vibrancy. Um, how, how design can affect economics, as John just mentioned uh, a minute ago, the example of the new lighting on University Way, uh, on the Ave, and finding that this hot dog stand had doubled its business or something. It can, it can make a huge difference. And then reinforcing that social and placemaking aspect of design, too, in addition to the aesthetics of, of buildings. So in this one, we have uh, four guidelines, and the way I like to view them myself is you can't have public life if you don't have any space to have it in. So the first, the first thing is open space, space connectivity. If you have a lot of isolated bits of open space, some of it private, some of it public, a public park over here, maybe a small plaza, commercial plaza over here, maybe sort of a front lawn, forecourt thing for a multifamily residence over, building over here. But they're not connected in any real way, either literally not con connected, there's literally no sidewalks, or maybe they're connected to, with sidewalks, but they're not connected in a design way. There's no con con continuous thread or continuity between them. It makes it a lot harder. You don't have that sort of um, network of spaces that people can live a public life in. And that's what cities are all about, right? Is being outdoors and meeting people that are like you or not like you or finding, stumbling onto interesting activities. So let's say you get the network in place and, and it's uh, a new project comes in and they show that they indeed are maybe following, using the same street tree that was used across the street uh, at the public park and drawing a line of continuity design-wise between their property and the public park. After that, in order to use it, it's got to be walkable. Okay, they're connected, but the sidewalk is still too narrow and there's no lights. Uh, that's not going to work. So you got to have the space, you got to make it walkable, safe, psychologically safe, really safe also. So perceived safetyness, actual safety, uh, interesting. Well, actually, interesting, I should say, for PL3, uh, Public Life 3, street level interaction. You've got the space, it's walkable, but is there any reason to walk there? 
it's got to be interesting. It's got to be. It's got to be fun. There's got to be some reason to get out there and something to look at, people to, to bump into. So that's what the third guideline is about, and that comes back to one of the things that John said in the very beginning: the um, retail and residential edges. Those are so important. The street level edges um, at the street level where people on the street interact with the buildings. That's where all of that happens. Then the fourth one is a little bit of a new wrinkle that, that wasn't in the original guidelines, but one that we popped in to encourage uh, projects to think more and more about what we call active transportation. You're either on foot, you're cycling, you're using transit, in which case part of the time you're a you're in a vehicle, but it's obviously it's a collective vehicle, and then the rest of the time you're a pedestrian. As you talked about earlier in your comments about the Safeway, I think it was, with the parking in the front, and, and John rightly commented that a lot of the corporate entities, retail entities, are really, they're really stuck in the suburban model of parking right in front at the door, and that all evolved during our earlier years in the 30s and, you know, with the ascendance of the automobile. Peeling that mentality back is really kind of hard, such that something that seems obvious, which is encourage people to walk to your building, kind of has to be said today, because for a long time, for many years now, it's been all about driving as close as you could to the front door. So it seems like even something that obvious needs to be restated, especially in, in a city where, where we are and where we have the density in many cases. Um, to encourage that larger pedestrian, you know, traffic and, and have people really use walking on their feet as their means of transportation or cycling. So, okay, then the last, the last section is what we call design concept. A strong design concept is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, a well-designed building is an essential building block to a livable and sustainable city. The, the whole big idea behind this is developer and designer, when you're looking at creating a new project, first look at where you're going. What is the context you're fitting into? Then please pay a lot of attention to, to where public life is going to occur, hopefully where it's going to occur, and, and please be, be someone who helps that happen. And then thirdly, we know your architects and landscape architects we know design is important, it's important to us too. The third section is really all about the project, the building, the solids, the building, the voids, the open spaces. And the point here being, I guess the best analogy for me would be uh, a little simple, maybe dumb analogy, but I'm, I, am, I consider myself a good recipe follower. I can, I can follow a recipe and it'll turn out and it'll taste really well, but I don't necessarily consider myself to be a good cook. And the difference is, sometimes you can follow all the instructions, but it still doesn't really hang together. You know what I mean? Maybe the whole meal is sort of, the side dish doesn't really go with the main dish. And they both taste good, but they really kind of go together. And it's the same idea with architecture here. And this is where I think the magic comes in a little bit with really strong designers. It's not only about doing good looking windows and having your modulation and, and having uh, some, some interest at the street level. That's all important and good, but where it really starts to sing is when the designer pulls all of that together in a way that is so integrated and knit together that you couldn't really change any one thing without the whole design unraveling. We don't always get something that's that great. That's the really magic piece. But when it does work, wow, it's just amazing. So we thought, let's put it in there. Let's at least strive for it, even if it's kind of tough to get to. And again, this is you know my, my sort of joke about this one is there's no there there. Um, again, that's where you have a building that maybe it's got some of the parts right, but still it just, it just doesn't really, it's not a thing of beauty. You know, It just didn't really make it happen. The guidelines that are in this section are really equivalent to the old guideline sections that dealt with height, bulk, and scale, architectural concept, and landscaping. And how different from the original ones? I guess in a way we did try to make more of an emphasis on the totality of the design. Um, all the details are, are critical 
and they make the design, but you, they've got to work together with it as a whole. So you're bouncing back in scale all the time. You're looking at small details of, of how, the, how, the, um, how the garbage is handled and, and treatment at the entries, but you're also looking at the overall volume and scale and mass of the building and, and how it sort of works as a piece of sculpture. The other uh, difference in this one is that there's a greater, in the updated guidelines, is there's a greater emphasis on open space as equal in importance to the architecture. Again, that notion of solids and voids. So these, this section has four guidelines. The first one is called Project Uses and Activities. If you're a design person, you know that, that the other word for that is uh, Project Program architectural lingo for basically what you're trying to do on the site. This is an important one I wanted to say one thing about. The zoning code is what tells uh, a, build, a uh, property owner what he or she can, can do on the site. You may have residential uses, you may have commercial uses, you may do manufacturing there. The zoning code tells you what the uses are. The design review board does not have purview over that. But what they do have purview over is how are you arranging those uses on the site? So in other words, let's say, let's say uh, there's a developer who's proposing a large building and it's going to have a restaurant at the ground level that would have sort of an open uh, courtyard area for seating. And let's say the first design they come in with shows that open courtyard area on the north side of the property for whatever reason. A completely legitimate uh, comment from the design review board or members of the community would be, why would you put it on the north side? It's going to be in shade 90, you know, 8% of the time. So is the board telling them what use to put on the site? No, but they are suggesting here's a better arrangement of those uses on the site. So that's the, what the first one is all about. Second one really is about that wholeness of things. The, the third one is, is also about wholeness, but related not to the building, but to the open spaces. Let's just make sure that they're not a bunch of leftover pieces after somebody plunked the building down. They should have just as much relationship to the building, those open space areas, um, as, and, and coordination and connection to them as they do to other open spaces outside, outside the site. And then the last one is almost verbatim the same as what's in the existing uh, guidelines. Exterior elements and finishes, and again, this takes it from the big picture, you know, uses, all the way down to the very specific. What materials are you using? What are the colors? Um, uh, what are the finishes? Are they appropriate for the neighborhood you're sitting in? Are they appropriate for the uses that you've identified for the building and that sort of thing? And I think that may be it. Yeah, that's it. Um, oh gosh, it's already 8:30, isn't it? Oh, uh, let's see. I guess I would just want to end with a couple things. Um, there is no design guideline, in my opinion, that can be written that will guarantee you a good piece of architecture. It doesn't happen that way. It's not like a recipe. Um, the real value in these guidelines, I think, has to do with some of the things I stated earlier in the, in the presentation. They set the context for the things that can be talked about. If you've been to design review board meetings, you know that the discussions are usually very rich. Um, in the best board meetings, it's, that's where it's all hammered out, is between intelligent people behind the desk, in the chairs, and those presenting, who all three, three entities, getting together and figuring out how are we going to make something here that really works as well as possible for everyone? How are we going to try and achieve excellence here? So it's really, in my opinion, the dialogue that, that makes the difference in design review. The guidelines are there to support that dialogue. The better educated everyone is who's part of the process, the better they understand what the expectations are and what the goals are, the, the richer that dialogue will be. And the better the dialogue is, the better your chances of coming out with a good good project. So that's just, you know, my opinion. And then the last thing I would add is just, um, John didn't talk a lot about it because I guess you guys already know uh, about it, but the visioning that he did for Wedgwood, that's an example of another kind of tool. Design guidelines are just one tool. It's not the only tool. 
Um, if you don't have them, which you currently don't in terms of specific ones for Wedgwood, it doesn't mean you can't go to a design review board meeting and still convey the same kinds of things that you want to say about what's important to you. The neighborhood design guidelines do give it a little extra teeth and it puts it in place and it sort of cements it, um, but in no way do they absolutely guarantee something that you couldn't also put forward just on your own as a community. So I just want to leave that out there with you as well. Um, sometimes there's a tendency, I think, for all of us to think that there's one silver bullet or one magic tool or document or whatever ordinance or whatever it might be that's just going to make everything perfect. And the, the bad news is <laughs> it's still just a lot of hard work, meeting by meeting, discussion by discussion. But it's also a really satisfying way and it's the best way to make it happen. So I, I guess I'll just end with that and, and just take any questions that you guys have of John and myself. Yeah. Sure. Um, correct me. The Seattle design guidelines for new construction only is it applicable for remodels? No. Okay. So there's no guidelines for remodels. No. Yeah. And it's and it's only uh, new commercial and multifamily development mm -hmm. of specific sizes that fit within thresholds. There has been discussion over the years of sort of expanding the scope of design review. Um, to, for example, more recent discussions around some of the townhouse development that, that has occurred that is of a lower density and lower sort of scale. Sure. Um, and that may still happen. It's not on the books right now. But. Any other? Yes? So looking at the pedestrian volume, um, open space connectivity, it says pedestrian okay. volume on page 8. Um, and you know, John's saying that you know, the best uh, sidewalk is to be around 12 feet. Mm -hmm. And this says provide ample space for pedestrian flow and circulation, particularly in areas where there's already heavy pedestrian traffic or the project is expected to create it. So, you know, our sidewalks now are like four and a half feet or something. So, could a developer say, well, I'm providing ample space because I'm giving you six feet, which of course is not eight or twelve. Right, right. So, given that it's so vague here, and I understand what yeah, you're yeah. saying, but what, what, what can we say? If they're, I mean, they can say, well, I mean it. You know, you have four and a half, we're yeah. six, but right. it's still not really adequate. Well, I think, I mean, correct me, John, if you have a different feeling on this. I, I think, again, it's as a rule of thumb, the 12 works because, as John mentioned, you can get two pairs of people right. walking past one another. Sure. But um, you haven't said at the 12. And we, and we specifically didn't. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, we didn't. Because there may be circumstances where, I mean, actually, public right of way and the place where it meets the private property line is some of the most sort of hotly contested space <laughs> in the city. There is so much that needs to happen there, uh, you know, from from electricity vaults and, and gas lines and all kinds of stuff. It's it's premium space that's in high demand. You may not always be able to get the twelve. The twelve may be ideal and. It, and sometimes be physically impossible to get it. Um, there also could be instances where, where maybe the, the 12, frankly, might, might overwhelm the context. Maybe you've got a, a narrower street that is quieter, where, where the 6 or 8, you know, would be sufficient. It kind of depends on the circumstance, I think. I mean, nobody's ever going to turn it down. If you, could get, if you could get more space, it'd be great to get it, but it doesn't mean it's failed if we don't have it, I guess is what I'm saying. But, John? Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, the 12 feet is what I generally use as a general rule, and but I was giving you just kind of general things mm -hmm. to consider. Um, uh, and 12 feet really is, is where you expect a high volume of, of mm -hmm. pedestrian traffic. Um, and that might be only for a couple of blocks here in Wedgwood. You know, if you really have this kind of your really key blocks here roughly 78 day, second, somewhere in there. I can't remember the street name. But, uh, I mean, the reason the citywide guidelines, I mean, don't have a specific number is because it really does vary. I think on side streets, six feet might be plenty. You know, I think in some residential areas, four feet mm -hmm. is more what you want. You don't want more paving than you need. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, <laughs> you don't want to uh, prescribe a number. Uh, 
sometimes you say, well, in such and such an area, like in a certain zone or a certain designated area, then you prescribe a number. But I don't think on a citywide basis you really can't do that. Is, um, is that what a neighborhood guidelines would come into? Or that we could prescribe a 12 for a certain block area and give and give them buses somewhere else like you, you mentioned? Well, I mean, you put the carrot in the, 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 the stick and carrot? Or the I'll, I'll defer to Cheryl on the, the use of the word prescribe. I think, that, like I say, the guidelines in Seattle are generally non prescriptive, as Cheryl explained. And, for the neighborhood and, guidelines? Huh? For the neighborhood guidelines? Come generally, down? they're not, they only modify the right. uh, citywide guidelines. So they, they're a little more, I mean, where I've seen them work, I think, and I'm not an expert on this, but I'll talk anyway, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Where, I, where, they, where they seem to work is um, uh, where the city, the, the community really has identified something that's really important. For example, in Green Lake, in the Green Lake area, uh, we did some design, neighborhood design guidelines, and they said, you know, there's certain areas, you know, that funny tangle of, of, uh, of uh, streets right there at the west side, of, uh, east side of Green Lake, you know, where the Ravenna comes in. They said, you know, there's some corners here that we really want to stand tall. They were really kind of signature corners for us. So they had a guideline that says on these corners, and they specified the corners, uh, we want something special to happen, and we want really good ample space. So, uh, and they got it in most cases, um, but there was one time when a developer came, the property owner said, you know, I need a couple extra stories. Um, then, and I said, this is a rezone, and I need your support to get it, so what do you want? And they go, ha! Ah, Got um, and uh, I mean not quite that, <laughs> but you know they knew. Hey, now we can make a deal, and so they said, well, we really want this really nice corner. We want this plaza open space. And Cheryl showed a picture of this development here. And they got a nice open space, and they got it's a beautiful, elegant building. Um, and the developer got their extra couple stories, and the community got exactly what it wants. It filled a nasty void with a you know very elegant building. So that's, um, really that's an example where you can really, it, in your guidelines, I think it's good to be specific, but, but don't expect that you get exactly what you ask for. Um, and, and it's really also good to explain why you want it. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so we want these things because we envision this, or you know, this, this sidewalk is right next to a park where we're going to have a heck of a lot of um, public activities, mm -hmm. and so we want pedestrian lighting. Whatever. Okay, it sounds like a way to think about it is if we want that space, then we have to give them space. Well, I mean, I, I think I got yeah. kind of in, in a way like that, but it's not, mm -hmm. to me, uh, the way Seattle works through design guidelines is, a, is a, it facilitates a conversation. So you sit down with the applicant in the city and the community members, uh, uh, and the city's represented by the design review board. And you talk about you know what's really important, and the design review board members say, you know that's right, you know that street really is important in this neighborhood. They they pulled that out and they've identified this, so then they tend to put a little more onus on the prop on a proponent to do those things. So it really does, I think, work quite well in a heck of a lot of situations. I would totally I totally agree with John, and what I think um, what I what I mentioned also is that. You know, the, the neighborhood guidelines, the 19 sets that we have, they were built on the shoulders of the original work that John his firm did. And in many ways, there, there, are, there are parts of all of them that have some, some real genius in them. The, the downside, I would say, there are quite a few of the neighborhood sets that sometimes say the same thing that's in here that applies citywide. Maybe they say it just slightly differently. And to my mind, Again, this is just personal opinion, but I would say, you know, in looking as I've seen all of them, that's less valuable to the folks involved in the process than, than site-specific information would be. The ones that are more success, successful in my mind are the ones that John mentioned where they said, these are our 100% corners. This is where it's important to us. Or this is the street, this is the area, the stretch we envision to be our pedestrian you know, what is it, the wrong gloss or something in, in uh, Barcelona where people go so out and see what we're to, If we were to look so, at those 19, what would yeah. be your top five? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot. Um, because why look at all 19 if we can just well, look at the five? Uh, no, I will say, I mean, they all have something a little different to offer. 
as a general rule, I would say we're, we're learning one after the other. So some of the more later developed ones, um, I think Capitol Hill and Pike Pine, is it Pike? I don't know, I can't remember which one, but one of them just redid theirs. So they are already in their second version. And their second version is, you know, I mean, I, I believe we can always get better. And I think theirs did, and it's starting to be better. And my hope would be, and then the, the ones here that Leslie and I worked on, we tried to build on the shoulders of this one and all the neighborhood ones, try to learn, learn what we could, and, and again strive to, to do it a little better, a little differently. And my hope would be that the next round of neighborhood guidelines, whether it's new neighborhoods that don't have any at all yet, or old neighborhoods who are looking to update theirs, my hope would be that they will each go even further and better with it. And I, and I think in my mind, better is get specific to your neighborhood. Talk about the areas that are important to you, the physical places. Talk about the, the qualities that are important to you, um, the values you have. Do you really, really value green space in your neighborhood? You know? Or do you really, really value a, a, a dense, vibrant cafe life? You know, those two could be at odds, and maybe it's okay in one neighborhood to say, we, we sacrifice one for the other. This one's more important to us. The one thing I would be careful about is the really prescriptive stuff. Because once you nail yourself down to a, a number, whether it's a sidewalk or any other thing, sure enough, maybe it's not tomorrow or the next day, but one day down the road there's a project going to come in that, would, that is proposing something that could be really, really cool, but unintentionally, your prescriptive guideline actually prevents it. So, you know, sometimes I think you just get a lot further with the dialogue than you do with the hard number because it's like trying to be a, a fortune teller and look into the future I mean none of us can ever really be that smart <laughs> to figure out all the things that may come to us you know the, the stuff that's really tried and true in terms of design is pretty nailed down in the original book here in a lot of seminal sort of books on urban design and architecture that go back you know a few centuries and some of the hard stuff is also in the land use code but so, other than that you know I have one, one hint that I think really helps, and that is uh, whatever, but the new guidelines will have an organization. And so when you think of things, you say something, here's what I think is important. Figure out where it fits. Mm -hmm. yeah. And organize your the community or neighborhood design guidelines with the same organization that this has. So, so when a reviewer comes by and says, okay, I'm going to think about uh, human scale. Okay. What do I think about human scale? He looks over, or she looks over at the neighborhood design guidelines and says, oh, well, what, um, what, these, uh, what, what these people have said is that the, the, the porches and the um, buildings just south of the main district there, the ones down by the Audubon Society, and those there, you know, I don't know how to say this, but yeah. they've said very specifically what that means for that particular community. And you don't have to cover every one. You just pick the ones, you know, find out what's important to you, take care of those, but fit them in the logical organization here so it's really clear to the, um, to the design review board what your intent is relative to the city-wide guidelines. Yeah, it makes it so much easier on them, and it's a good way to organize.